welcome to week nine. Let's try that again. Uh, week nine should now be visible since apparently it disappeared on me again. Hope everybody had a restful week as much as it could be. Um, we are now starting off with the second half of this term, which is the more practical hands-on aspects. We're done with the theory side of the deal, conceptually at least. And we are actually gonna learn about interacting with the database and, you know, can't believe I'm gonna say this word. What most people think of as programming a database, it's not, but a lot of uh, new people think that's what it is. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of SQL. And then I'm going to show you guys how you'd actually, you know how last term you use the design tool to create your tables in MySQL Workbench? I'll show you guys how you actually type in those commands and actually do it by hand. Uh, some people often ask me, why is it important to know how to type this stuff in by hand? Um, I'll explain why it's important soon enough. Um, I'll explain how to set up a referential integrity, uh, show you guys how to create some SQL constraints and whatnot. Um, there are a few items listed here that aren't even in today's lecture. They're just leftover points from previous. Okay, so SQL stands for Structured Query Language. Uh, it was developed by IBM in the late 1970s. And this is where I point out that SQL is an initialism, not an acronym. It is SQL. It's SQL. That'd be like saying SQL is created by IBM. Um, the funny thing is the reason why a lot of people call it SQL is originally IBM tried to trademark the SQL language as SQL, S-E-Q-U-E-L. And then a company in Great Britain took them to court and won because they'd already trademarked it. it had a worldwide copyright and trademark on that phrase. And it wasn't even a database product, but they made it vague enough that they won. Um, so IBM just turned around and said, okay, is that a SQL? It's SQL, but for some unknown reason, 40 years later, 50 years later, it's still SQL for some people. It's SQL. Um, there are lots of versions that have come out over the years. Um, and essentially they're marked as a SQL and a year. So SQL and a year. God, I can't believe I just said SQL. I just fried my own brain. And so the most common standard right now is SQL 1999. 1999 is the year that almost all the modern features that most database developers use was finally added in. Like it, it accumulated to that point where 90% of what people use, 95% people use is there. A lot of database servers for the longest times was their thing. We are SQL 99 compliant, check mark. Um, and then over the years, 2008, 2011, 2016, I think there's a new one. I haven't checked recently because I haven't used any new features and that's come out in any of them since the 1999 version because it does everything I needed to do. Um, so some of them brought in the concept of built-in XML parsing. And then somewhere along the way, they said, hey, XML is stupid. Now we're going to do JSON parsing. Uh, not all database servers support JSON. Uh, there's some that have object-oriented concepts. Um, for example, PostgreSQL supports um, table inheritance, where you can create a table. Then you create another table that inherits the first table, then you can add extra properties, just like you do in Java with a class. Uh, it's really cool. Uh, almost nobody does it. but it's really cool that you can. Um, so for those of you that have picked up the course textbook, you'll notice that they use SQL Server 2019 in the textbook. Um, however, we're gonna be using MySQL Server for the demos in this course because we're not cruel enough to make you guys have to use SQL Server at level one. Um, because some of you will probably still have pretty crappy laptops at this stage, and SQL Server will bring them to its knees and make it cry mummy. Um, which is fine, because you need MySQL Server for level two database anyways. Uh, you guys are a computer programmer, right? 
Yeah, okay. Level 2 database. The CT guys don't have a level 2 database, so that's why I had to catch myself. Okay, so SQL is known as a sub-language. It's because it's not known as, it's not a full-featured programming language. There's um, two kinds of programming language, well, there's more than two, but there's basically two kinds of programming languages in the world. General purpose languages and um, I lost the word. Um, single purpose languages, essentially. A general purpose language is Java, PHP, C, Python. You can write pretty much any kind of program you want in it because it supports all the functionality you need in a program. A single purpose language is like a specialist. It does a few things, one or a few things, very, very well. Its purpose is very defined. It doesn't expand outside of that world. SQL is a single purpose language. Yes, it does a lot of different little things, but its job is to talk to databases. That's it. There's no loops. There's no variables. There's no, there, there are conditionals, technically, kind of. But they're more like Excel conditionals than, you know, a NIF statement in Java. So its purpose is to deal with the database. SQL is ubiquitous. Essentially, if it's an enterprise class database system, it's got SQL. Unless it's a no SQL database, uh, which for the longest time was the bright new exciting topic. Like everybody, oh, no SQL, so cool. And then everybody realized that no SQL was stupid. It has a place, it's very good at what it does, but it's not good for structured data because it's unstructured. So literally, the point of it, it's unstructured. You could take raw data and shove it into a database, read it out later when you need it. Well, that's why it's fast, because it doesn't need to worry about the rules, because there are no rules. Um, they're, that's why they're really good for running as a cache server or for data warehousing and that kind of thing where you don't need to worry about the rules. Um, SQL programming is a critical skill if you ever intend to work with a database. And this is where I hearken back to my days in college. I almost failed one of my database courses. It's actually, it was Oracle administration. So it wasn't like SQL or that kind of stuff. It was Oracle administration because I said to myself, I'm never going to work in databases. I hate it. First job, database. Second job, database. Third job, five different databases. It got worse. And the job I've had now for 23 years, database. You cannot get away from it. Regardless of what you do for a living, you, as a developer, you will interface with a database. Whether or not you are working with a database at a low level or at a high level, as in, are you the person designing, implementing the database, or are you the developer programming in Java or PHP or whatever, interacting with the database, or are you the person that does the whole thing, right? The range from top to bottom is quite wide. Um, however, even the top level programmers have to understand how SQL works. Even if you're using something called an ORM, it's an object relation uh, management tool. Basically, it's a chunk of code that abstracts the database for you. It still looks like SQL. It just, it breaks it down so you can code it. Uh, but in the end, sometimes there's just some things the ORM can't do and you still have to type in SQL. So it is what it is. So take it from someone who, you know, in his last semester, in his sixth semester, decided, you know, I'm really freaking tired now. Um, this course, it's not getting my full attention. I should have paid attention. <laughs> All right, so SQL is broken down into several categories. And there is the DDL, which is the data definition language. It's what's used to create the tables, the relationships, and the other structures. Essentially, it's the construction crew that builds the house. So you had your dad designer create this, the, the blueprint. DDL actually builds the house. DML 
is what's used for querying the data. So it adds, updates, deletes, and retrieves data. It's the people that fill your house and decorate it for you. There's SQL PSMs. We're not even going to go there. Um, that's like, maybe you'll see that level two. Um, we have TCL, which is arguably its own thing, but it's not. Uh, we're going to be talking about the transaction control stuff at the end of the semester. Um, but essentially, it's a series of statements that you use in SQL to control how you update the data. And you have a DCL, which is the data control language. Um, that is permissions, security, who has access to the database, who's allowed to do what to the database, that kind of thing. For this course, we're only going to worry about the first two items. So literally today, we're going to cover DDL almost in its entirety today with a tiny little bit of DML. Um, and then for the rest of the semester, it's basically DML all the way through because that's where the bulk of learning it is. All right, so in DML, when you want to create a new object, the command is create. Mind blowing. And specifically, if you want to create a table, it's create table. And then you have to define the columns, the data types, the constraints, that kind of thing. And the structure looks roughly like what's on the screen here. Create table, new table name, define the columns, close it, and there's a semicolon. And after I've actually get through a few slides, I'll actually switch to MySQL and show you guys the commands so you actually see visually what it's doing. Uh, constraints can be defined with the create table command or later on with the alter table command. So, you know, if you create something to change it, it's alter. To get rid of it is drop. Um, there are constraints that include things such as primary key. That's a word you guys should know by now. Uh, a foreign key. That's also another word you guys should know by now. Uh, null and not null. Uh, that's whether something is required or not. Uh, is it unique? Is it a check constraint? Uh, the default keyword, which is technically not a constraint, but you can set initial values with it. Um, now, what's cool is that unique is usually part of an index. Um, check constraints don't work in MySQL. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on check constraints because MySQL can't do them. Uh, pretty much every other database product can. That's slightly beefier. So Postgres, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, DB2, you know, Teradata, all those big boys all have it. Okay, so this is an example, but I usually don't use the examples in these slides. I'll actually show you guys. I'd rather show you guys. So I'm going to switch to MySQL Workbench. And I just want to make sure things are recording. Yes. So I don't have a repeat of last week. <laughs> uh, two weeks ago. Okay. So this is MySQL Workbench. I'm actually going to start from the start so you guys have an idea where to go in the labs. When you launch MySQL Workbench, you'll see something that looks like this. You may have one or more connections down here. It might not be written the same way as mine, but it'll be similar. You click on it. They might prompt you for a password. It comes to this. On the left, you have the various databases. Uh, MySQL insists on calling them schemas. I have no idea why. They're databases. On the right is where you type in your commands. Uh, this is your run button. This is run what's only under the cursor. Um, this is the explain command, and I'll do. I'll be showing you guys what explain does later in the term. Uh, and there's a few other things in here. So, although the first slides you guys saw was create table, I'm actually going to show you one very important command. Okay, create database. Because I don't have an example database right now to use for you guys, therefore I'm going to create one. So, do I really need to explain what those three words are going to do? It's going to create a database. It's going to be called Lecture 6. And I'm going to run it. And you will see that it ran in 0 0.015 
seconds. And so right now you'll notice I created the database, but you're not seeing it down the left side. You actually have to refresh this for it to show. It's just my SQL workbench thing. Other database servers will do it. Some will, some won't. It just depends how the software is written. Now, the next command you guys need to know about is use. This is saying, hey, I want you to connect to the Lecture 6 database. And every command I'm going to type in here going forward will be executed against Lecture 6. And you'll see that on the left, like other database software won't look exactly like this. You'll see that Lecture 6 is now bolded. It expanded, and you see there's nothing in there because I just created an empty vessel. You can picture as in I just flattened a lot. You know, I just bought a piece of land. I'm going to build a house. I just bulldozed it nice and flat. Now we're ready to build. Place is empty. We've got room to build. So now I'm going to create my table. Now, some students often ask, is SQL case sensitive? The answer is no. The SQL keywords are not case sensitive. Depending on what database engine you're using, object names and column names may be. Postgres, they are case sensitive. SQL Server, they may be, they may be case sensitive. Oracle just lies because it stores it the way you typed it in originally and then it stores it in uppercase so it can always match it. And MySQL just says, I don't care. Just make it, which is why it's a really popular database for beginners because they don't need to be as disciplined. But these keywords are not case sensitive. Like I could literally type this in like this and that would work just fine. Heck, I'll leave it like that for now, just for fun. And you give it an action. Oh, that's actually hurting my brain. Uh, I'm going to create my first table. I'm going to call it example. So this will create a table called example. You'll notice that it's complaining about an error. Like there's a little you know error marker here. It's because I have not given it any columns yet. You can't create an empty table without columns. So I'm going to give it the first column. It's called ID. It's going to be an integer. And I'm going to use, if you guys remember in MySQL Workbench when you're doing the diagrams, there was a column called AI, which does not stand for auto artificial intelligence. It stands for auto increment. So auto increment. Auto increment is a MySQL specific keyword. And this is also going to be the primary key. So this table will have a column called ID. It's an integer. That's going to auto increment every time you add a record. It's going to create it as the primary key. Fantastic. And then I'm going to add another column called name. It's going to be a var car. I don't know, 75. It's not null. Because I want it to have a value. If I try to insert it and I don't provide name, it will give you an error saying, dude, you suck. Um, email, varkar150. I'm going to allow that one to be null. So you, I could put in the keyword null, or I could just exclude it. If you don't include not null, it assumes that it is null. So you can save yourself a little bit of typing. Um, I'm going to add in... Um, Well, every time I try to do this one, it always causes me problems. Let's see if it's going to let me do it. All right. Because I am because I usually don't work with MySQL, so every single time I do this example, I get it wrong at least three times. Um, the database server I work with supports this kind of stuff like, like that. So, all right, I'm going to hit the Run button. And it ran. Great. So now... If we actually want to see it, we can go refresh on the left. And here's our table, and here's our happy little columns. And that is how you create a table. If I wanted a, I'll be providing links to all the full create table syntax. Like literally, we could spend two lectures on create table. However, what I just showed you guys here covers 80% of what you need. I'll be covering a little bit more, which will give you the next 10%. That last 10% are edge cases.
when you need to do something a little weird out of the ordinary. Um, so that's our create table command. Because this is a MySQL workbench thing. Technically, name is a reserved keyword. However, it's a reserved keyword in the SQL language that's never been used by anybody. So the SQL interpreter, when it's color coding and error checking, says, sees the word name and it goes, it's a keyword, it's blue. It's a keyword that nobody ever used. Uh, why? Because database developers use name all the time and they decide, you know, it's just not worth implementing the keyword name. There are places it's used in certain database servers as a very low level command. Like you're trying to extract like the name of a database object. So that becomes like a magic keyword. Okay, so I just showed you guys how to do that table one way. I am going to create another table Almost exactly the same, but instead of having the primary key as part of the, this is called the uh, primary key short form. As in when you include primary key as part of the field definition, what you can do is you can also go constraint. Yeah, well, that's what it is. And we're gonna go example PK. Uh, primary key ID. Now, I'm actually going to run it and this, this is actually going to generate an error. One of the things you need to learn about SQL is learn to read the error because the errors are actually pretty good, but they are not errors like they are in Java. As you know, in Java, you'll get an error and say, you have an error at character 45 on line, line 36. They're not like that in SQL. Usually it'll give you an error message and it's one of two things. You're not allowed to do that, which is gonna be pretty clear because I'm about to do that. Or you have an error at this point. When you see an error at that point, that means there's something wrong before it. Somewhere before it, there's something wrong. You missed a comma, you, you know, all kinds of things. I'm gonna hit run. And here's our first error message. I can't make this any bigger. But you'll see the error message says, table example already exists. I don't know how much clear error message can be. It's saying you're not allowed to create it a second time. You cannot create the same thing twice with the same name. I can create the same thing a second time if I give it a new name. So if I go example two, that worked. And they're both tables are gonna be exactly the same. And you'll see that this has an index that's a primary key. This has an index that's a primary key. The structure looks the same. How I define the primary key is different. The time you want to use this syntax for the primary key is when you have a compound key where you need to list off more than one column. Something like that. And that would create a compound primary key. Now back to here. Uh, on here, there's just an example of a unique constraint. Um, that's, you know, in this case, it's making sure the first name and last name of the artist in this table is always unique. You know, whether or not you choose to do that, that's up to you, but you could also do a unique on an email address, which is probably much more convenient, that kind of thing. Okay, so this is a significantly larger example. Um, and it covers all kinds of things. And this is actually showing how to do a foreign key. And again, instead of using the slide, I'll actually go through it and show you guys. It's way clearer. Okay, so I'm going to create a table called uh, child, not chunk, child. And I'm going to leave the ID there as is. And I'm gonna call this one example ID. That's an integer. 
And there are two ways to define a primary key, the quick way and the long way. Foreign key. Uh, no, actually, it's not foreign key here. It's references, references, example, ID. Okay, so this is the short form for a foreign key. There are catches or caveats when you use the short form. One, you can't name it. Two, you cannot tell it what its rules of engagements are. It will it will just use whatever the defaults are for that database. <clears throat> In a moment, I'll show what I mean by changing your defaults. Um, the, one of the things you have to make sure when you use a foreign key is that the data type on the column matches the data type of the source column. So this is saying that example ID is an integer and it's gonna reference the example table and ID. So it's saying there are values in this table, I mean, this column must exist in the ID of the example table. If it's not there, it won't allow the record to be created. So that's the short way to create the foreign key. I can also go around and create, um, I can go constraint, uh, example two, FK, foreign, P. Do I get the syntax right here? Yes. Example underscore ID, references, example two, ID. You can see how much more wordy this one is. This is when you need to create a foreign key that is a compound key, or you need to name it, or it's a compound key that also has compound source elements. So, you know, and some of you guys, when you did your designs for the assignment where you drag and drop, then it actually brought across two columns. That's what this is for, is when you need to do more than just the basics. And it has a little more than that. Uh, you can go on update. Um, on delete. So these ones here are, remember a minute ago, I talked about how if you use the short form, it accepts whatever the rules of engagement are by default for the database engine. So it's saying on update, no action. It's saying if you tried to delete the parent record without deleting the child record first, it'll block you, it says no action allowed. Um, you can set it to set null. Uh, there's a few other, depending on the database engine, someone will allow you to delete the child, cascade, that kind of thing. It depends on what the engine supports. But this is how you create that foreign key. So when you had your diagram and you drew the line from one table to another and you created the foreign key with the child record, that that's literally the code behind the scenes once it's put into the database engine. So this is basically punching a door between two rooms and saying, you know, whatever's in this room has to exist before you can put something in this room. Okay, so when you're doing the cardinalities, you essentially have a few different situations, right? Where you have parent optional, uh, parent required. So essentially on the foreign key, to make it required, you'd mark it as not null. So here we'd go, not null. That means that the parent is required when you create the child. If it was null, the parent is optional. That means that you could create the child record and then later populate the uh, the value in that field. A good example of this would be on an order. You place an order with Amazon. And the shipping method is not set until they literally put it on a truck. And is it going to be Intelcom? Is it going to be delivered by Amazon? Is it going to be PureLater, FedEx, Canada Post? There's a bunch of ways your stuff could get delivered. So on that order, the shipping method gets set later. That means the order record gets created, but then the shipping method gets added on later. So that means it's an optional foreign key, which would mean it allows to be null. Just like that. <laughs> on the other hand, the shipping address is required right off the bat because I'm assuming almost everybody in here has bought something on Amazon. 
we've all bought something on Amazon, most of us. When you go to check out, it asks you where you want to ship it, right? And you could have multiple locations it's shipping at. And depending on where it's shipping at, you know, you pick one and that order is placed against that location. So it's also a foreign key because they have your addresses already in the system. But as part of the order, the shipping address is required. Therefore, it's a not null foreign key. Um, on a one-to-one -one relationship, um, you set the foreign key to be unique so you can never create a second child. That's how you make it one-to-one. -one. Because as far as the database server is concerned, when you create a foreign key, it doesn't care if it's one-to-one -one or one-to-many. The way you make it one-to-one -one is by making the child record, like the foreign key, unique. So you mark that one as unique. Um, and then if it's parent required to be unique and not null, um, so there's such thing as, thing as a casual relationship. Um, a casual relationship is if you create the column, but you never actually define the foreign key. So essentially you're saying, this is a foreign key, but we don't care what you actually put in it. So this could be total garbage that's in this. We're just not going to, we're just going to let it roll. Um, they're not good foreign keys. If you're not enforcing the rules, it's not a good foreign key. All right. And here's the granddaddy example of them all. I'm not even going to go through all of these. Um, because the first couple you've seen already, like the first chunk up here, from here to here you guys have seen, down here is check constraints. And like I said before, check constraints don't really work in MySQL. You can actually define them, but they won't actually do anything. So MySQL, okay, we all know someone like this. When you tell somebody not to do to do something or not do something and they just ignore you, that's what MySQL does. With any commands it doesn't understand or anything it doesn't actually support, instead of saying, hey, dude, I can't do that, it goes, gotcha, fam. No problem. And then it just pretends it never even heard it. So these are examples of check constraints, which is kind of cool. So in here, you'll see that it has nationality, date of birth, and a few other things. And it's in here, it's saying nationality value check. So it's creating a rule check, and it has to be one of these. If it's not in one of those, you'll get an error when you try to insert. Um, birth value check. Checks of the date of birth is before the date of death. Because you can't have someone die before they're born. Well, technically, yes, but that's kind of depressing. However, this is saying you can't add a record with those dates inverted. Again, it'll give you an error. And then it goes valid birth year. It's basically checking to make sure that all the digits are actually between 1 to 9, except for the first one, which is 1 to 2. Um, Honestly, I wouldn't write it like that. So I go date of birth greater than 1900-1-1 instead of trying to get fancy. Um, you know, it is what it is. All right. So if ever you need to write check constraints, this is a good slide to refer to. The rest of this, on the other hand, is all cool. So... The SQL alter statement is a statement used to change the structure of a database. So, you know, the house is built. Suddenly you realize that all the doors are, you know, one inch too narrow. Or you suddenly realize you want to put a new window or something, right? Alter table allows you to change the structure. You can add, remove, and change columns. You can use it to add, remove constraints. So you can actually drop primary keys. You can remove check constraints. Uh, you can set the defaults on certain columns, uh, that kind of thing. So the most common task you guys are going to do is adding and removing columns manually. And the command is alter table, whatever it's called, add the column, and the rest of it reads just like the create table statement. And it'll be easier if I demonstrate this. Nope. Over here. So if I go alter table example two, 
add uh, active tiny int one default one. All right, so what this is going to do is I'm going to alter the table called example two. I'm going to add a new column called active. And of course, active seems to be a reserved keyword also, but it lets me do it anyways. I'm going to set it to tiny int one because MySQL doesn't have true Booleans. And MySQL use a tiny int, which means you have a zero to nine versions of yes and no. Um, we've all had that friend when they don't have an answer of just yes and no. MySQL is that friend. Uh, there's shades of yes and no. Or actually, there's no, and then nine shades of yes. And I'm going to default it to one. So anytime I try to add a record, if I don't include a column called active, it'll automatically set it to one. If I choose it to not be at default to one, then I can choose as part of the insert to put in a different value. And I'm going to go run. Um, oh, look at this. It's saying, hey, Integer display width is deprecated. That's nice. So this syntax from old MySQL is going to go away in MySQL 9. That's what that error. I've never actually seen that warning before. That's kind of cool. So now I have this column here called that. So if you can see right here, there's our active column. Kind of cool. And if I wanted to get rid of this column, I could just go drop. And you notice I wrote the drop lowercase because it doesn't care. And if I hit run and reload, it's now gone. So, so far you guys have witnessed me creating a table, me creating a table with foreign key, with the primary key constraints, uh, null, not null, setting the data types, adding a new column, removing a column. Um, there's a few other things you can do with it. Um, the column keyword is only used when you're dropping column, but not when adding one. Depends on the database server. That's a very generic statement. Um, for example, Postgres, you have to have add column. You have to have drop column. It requires you to use the full keyword instead of a shortened keywords. But obviously it allowed me to do the drop without the word column. You just witnessed me do it. Um, if you want to add a constraint, you alter the table, you add a constraint, same syntax as when you're creating it, uh, and drop constraint is you drop it by name. Now, to remove a table, it is super easy to get rid of a table in SQL, um, but you got to be careful. Uh, because not only will it drop the table, it'll also nuke all the data. And there's actually a few interesting caveats when you're dropping tables. Um, I am going to try to drop table example two. And I'm going to hit go. And it let me, because MySQL is special that way. Good job. Shouldn't have let me do that. I bet you. No. I was curious if this was using the wrong database engine. Um, oh, I know why. I never hit the run button. Oh. See, remember earlier I said it's important to read the error message? I kept hitting the run button without actually reading the error message. 
There we go. Now, if I refresh this table, it's ignoring that. I love it. Okay, let's go child four. Comma. Constraint. Example. F key four. Uh, foreign key. Example underscore ID. And run that one more time. And is it going to do it? So you can see where it's creating the foreign keys on the child tables. So now I'm going to try to drop the table called example. Oh, I know why it's letting me because there's no data. So that's why it let me do it. So as you can see over here on the left, when I ran the drop example, it dropped that table completely like a hot potato. And you will notice if you look at this row, how long did it take to drop that table? 0 0.015 seconds. There's no way you're going to hit the stop button fast enough to recover. By the time you actually get that feedback, it's already done. So one of the dangers of SQL is there is no such thing as undo. For those of you that are used to doing the good old control Z, or whatever it is on Mac, the Apple key Z or control, whatever the frig it is, control key Z, whatever the heck it is on Mac, function key, whatever it is. There is none of that SQL. You run the command, it happens. It's going to do exactly what you told it to do. Not always what you want it to do. It's going to do exactly what you told it to do. And as a person who has destroyed databases by accident, you don't spend 23 years doing 20, oh Lord, 26 years doing this without accidentally breaking things when you haven't had enough coffee at 3 a.m. because that's when they scheduled you to do that job. Um, you want to make sure you don't mess this up. And the way drop table works is very sneaky. It doesn't actually delete the data off the disk. It just tells the database this table no longer exists. It takes it out of the database structure. The file is still on the disk. The data is still on the disk, but the data no longer exists as far as the database engine is concerned. <clears throat> Has anybody here ever tried to recover deleted file on their computer? You know how you got these special tools and you run it and then it mar it finds files have been marked for deletion. The way that works, whether it's in Windows pre Windows NT or in modern version of Windows, um, Unix based ones are even more dangerous because their drives are always so busy that there's almost no chance of recovering anything. What it does is it marks that space as available on the disk. It's not gone. The data is still on the disk. It's just as far as the operating system is concerned, that space is now up for grabs. It's available. Database server does the same thing. And then every once in a while, there's an automated process that comes around behind the scenes and different database engines call it something different. Um, I don't remember what MySQL calls it, but uh, Oracle and Postgres call it vacuuming. It's a great one. And what it does, it looks at the tables at, and it looks at for any deleted data and it starts purging the disk later. So there is no undo. Which brings us to that whole warning about make sure it's the one you want to drop because when you drop it, it's going to be gone instantly. Um, honestly, dropping a table with a million rows might take, you know, tenth of a second more than dropping an empty table. You will not have time to recover. Uh, that's why you have backups. Um, there are two other small chunks of code at the bottom on how to rename columns. Um, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. 
you alter the table, give it the name, you rename column from this to that. Um, changing the data types depends on which database engine you're using. Therefore, we don't really cover changing the data types in the lecture because depending on what you end up working with later, how you do it is going to be different. This is where you reference the manual or your friend ChatGPT. I, I don't have a problem with asking questions like that of ChatGPT going, hey, ChatGPT, how do I rename a column? How do I change the data type of column in MySQL? It'll give you a really nice answer. I have no problems with using ChatGPT for that kind of stuff. So when in a, in a same database engine where referential integrity is fully enforced, you cannot drop a table if it has child tables referencing it. So I'm going to try to drop my example table again, and hopefully it'll work this time because I created the child records. Table example. I'm going to hit go. There, finally, that one worked. You'll, or did not work. It worked the way I expected it to not work. That's better. Down here, you'll see an, an error message. You can ignore the error code. It says, cannot drop table example, referenced by a foreign key constraint, and it gives you the name of the foreign key. So what it's saying is you're not allowed to get rid of this table until you kill its kids too. You have to delete, get rid of all the child records or the child table or get rid of the constraint. So I could alter the table, which in this case is child four. So if I go alter table child for drop constraint, and it's child for all one word, drop constraint, and it's called example fk4, and I'm going to run it. That's gone. I'm going to change this back to try to drop my table, and now it's gone. Because I took out the foreign key on this guy. And um, this one didn't have a foreign key because I didn't create it properly. Once you get rid, so what I did is I told this child, you no longer belong to example. This foreign key has nothing to do with, the, we basically broke the link. We cut the link between the two tables. Then I can nuke the table. So now I got to bring back my... Uh, my original example table. So it's back, uh, nah, nah, nah. oops, bang, table is back. So that's dropping. Um, this is the other way what I just did is I dropped the constraint, then dropped the table. Um, now truncate. Truncate table is one of the commands that lives somewhere between DDL, which is the de defining objects, and DML, which is manipulating objects. The reason why it lives somewhere in between is because depending on the database engine you're using, it will actually modify the structure of your tables also. In MySQL, it resets your auto increment to one. In other database engines, it does not because other database engines do their auto increment in a different way. Truncate um cannot be used on a table that is referencing uh that is being referenced so for example if i have a bunch of records in the example table and a bunch of records in the child table i can't truncate the example table until i got rid of the matching records in the child table there is a an add-on which is called cascade which is super dangerous because truncate will then not only nuke the parent records, it'll kill all the child records too. The whole family tree goes. Like if there are if there's a record referencing the child and a record referencing that child, four or five layers deep cascade will go through and just wipe it all out like it never existed. Um so that's why we say be really, really careful uh with truncate, especially if you use truncate the table, whatever it's called, um, 
and you use the cascade keyword uh, because it will happily just wipe out the contents of your database. Um, later this uh, later in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the delete command. And I'm going to show you guys the difference between delete and truncate at that point. Because um, there is a really big functional difference between the two. Um, even though for some people, they, they think it's the same thing. Um, create index. I'm actually going to talk about indexes later in the term. So I'm going to skip any slides here that talk about index. All right. So before I talk about insert, essentially we just covered the majority of DDL. Um, well, as far as things and columns are concerned. Uh, you have other objects in the database like indexes and views and that kind of stuff, which all follow very similar syntax. Uh, different database engines have slightly varia slight variations on them. Um, so again, refer to your favorite chat bot to help you figure out the syntax. Uh, way easier than digging through the documentation. Um, so for assignment two, which I have not assigned yet, the last 50 minutes covers part one of assignment two. I literally showed you how to do parts of assignment two in this lecture. Um, I literally, by the end of like next week's lecture, you got like 80% of the the assignment, the stuff for the assignment. So you just got to do the labs so you're comfortable. Okay, so we've created our table. We've defined the contents of our table. Now we want to add data to our database. The command to add data into the database is called insert. It's not create. Some people get confused and they'll say, oh yeah, I want to create some records, so I'm going to use create. No, no, create creates the object. You're going to insert a record. And you've got to think in 1970s concepts here, right, where databases and computing was a new concept. And SQL originally was created for managers. Because up to that point, database work was heavy-duty programming, like you were using COBOL or Progress or one of those four GLs to manage the databases, where the database and the language are basically the same thing. Uh, SQL abstracts the database. And they wanted to make it so that it was usable by managers. So they tried to come up with keywords that would make sense to someone that works in an office. So if we think of a database as a filing cabinet and each table as a folder in that filing cabinet, when you take a piece of paper and you put it in that folder, what are you doing? You're inserting it into the folder, which is where the insert keyword comes from. They, they said, okay, we, people will understand visually if you take a piece of paper and you put it in a file folder, that is being inserted into a filing cabinet. So if you have, this is why you'll remember why it's called an insert, because you'll think about all those managers who are totally capably, incapable of doing anything, inserting files in a file folder. And when you insert, um, there's a few different ways of doing it. Um, and I love these examples, you know, example code do not run, because if you don't have those tables, they won't work. So there's a few different ways of doing the inserts. You can choose to name each of the columns. You can choose to not name any of the columns. If you don't name any of the columns, you must supply a value for every column in the table. If you only have specific values, in other words, you know that some of the columns are nullable and you don't want to supply those right away, you can just name the columns. I normally recommend that you name your columns because that way, you're not going to have a mystery about where the data is going. So I'm going to come back to here and I'm going to go and we're going to find out if my uh, default now thing is going to work. Um, I may need to drop that default uh, syntax between different database servers, right? So if I go insert into example and I'm going to refresh my view on the side so that you guys can see the columns. And example, and I'm going to feed it a list of columns, name, comma, email, comma, created, values. And white space is not important.
I don't know today's date. That's okay. Like that. Okay. So you will see that I specified three columns that I'm inserting into, and I'm specifying three values. It's basically saying Bob's going to go into name, email is going to have bob at mail.com, created will have that date. And I'm going to hit run. And it shows one row affected. Nifty. So if you want to see what's in this table without typing any SQL, if you double click on it, oh, no, sorry, different database engine. I want to go select rows. You'll see right here, here's bob at mail.com. I added the record. Um, ID one, because remember when I created that table, I set ID to be auto increment. So if I were to put in Bob a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time, and a fifth time, and I come here and I just rerun this, and it gave me rules. Here's my error message I wasn't paying attention to. It's saying unknown column, name example in the field list. Um, that basically is saying it doesn't know what you're trying to insert into. So if you see something that looks like that, that means that you're putting in the wrong values. Let's try doing that again. All right, that worked better. So I'm going to run this. And now you can see I've got Bob in here five times. The other thing you'll notice, they let me put in the same values multiple times because I didn't have any unique constraints. The primary key is auto-incrementing. That means that because the primary key is auto-incrementing, every row is unique. It allows you to do all kinds of nifty things. Um, Now I'm going to see if my uh, default value for created is going to work. Probably not. Oh, it worked. You will see that I did not specify the created column this time. I didn't give it a time or a date. So instead, it actually ran. There's something called now. There's a function called now. You guys know about functions in Java by now. Maybe you learned about functions, kind of. You know? String functions, integer functions, math functions, that kind of stuff. There are functions in SQL, and there's one called now. What does now do? It gives you the current timestamp, date and time, according to whatever the database server says the current date is. So as you can see, it's July 5th, 3.05 p.m. Yes, it is. So that's when you have default values, that's what the inserts are going to do. That's literally all there is to insert. It's not hard. The hardest part of SQL, and you'll discover this, the hardest part of SQL is learning the syntax of each of the commands. It's not like Java where every single kind of thing you want to do follows a similar syntax. Like a while statement is almost the same as a for statement, more or less in concept. In this, I swear, whoever was designing this language they had a bunch of guys sitting in different rooms not talking to each other. So he goes, you're going to do insert, you're going to do update, you're going to do delete, and you're not allowed to talk to each other. As you can see, the create table command looks very different from the alter table command because whoever was doing the insert probably did the in the you know create table, whoever did the alter did the update. In a moment, I'll show you guys update and you'll see what I mean. Um, Bulk data, I'll talk about later in the term. Uh, I've never seen that question on the exam, so it's not important. It allows you to take the data from one table and put it in another table, essentially. It's copying. Okay, update command. And I will actually demonstrate. I'm going to go update example. Set name equal to uh, Daisy where ID is equal to one. Okay, so looks completely different than the insert statement. I told you it was gonna be completely different. So essentially the way this works, the update statement works is it'll update whatever table you gave it, right? So it'll update example. It'll set the name equal to Daisy. And I can actually change, uh, you can give it multiple columns at the same time. Email is equal to daisy at mail.com. And that will 
update both columns at the same time, where ID is equal to one. So I'm going to run this. No error messages. And as you can see how fast that run, 0 0.016 seconds. Um, again, you don't have time to, oops, I didn't want to do that. If I come and refresh my example table, you will see that now row one is now Daisy instead of Bob. Um, so literally that's all there is to the update. There is a big danger though with update. You'll notice there's some, something down here I didn't actually talk about. This is the where clause and we will be spending an inordinate blah, a lot of time on it. Can't get the word out today. Over the next few weeks about the where clause. The where clause is where all the meat and potatoes of SQL is. Essentially, this is the simplest where clause you can get. It's saying, I want you to update the record in example where the primary key, which is called ID, is equal to one. That's it. That's literally what this is saying. Anybody want to take a guess what happens if I don't include that? Don't be shy. Okay, I had a lot of voices, but nobody actually saying anything loud enough for me to hear you. What will happen if I do this without the where clause? Yes, to whoever said change all, it'll do them all. Because you're not saying, I want you to update this row. You're saying, I just want you to update everything. So if I run this, like I said before, SQL will do exactly what you told it to do. Not necessarily what you want it to do. And if I come back to my example table, now everybody identifies as Daisy. And there's no undo. So now everybody's Daisy, whether they want to be Daisy or not. So just got to be a little careful. Okay. Um, yeah, that's update. <laughs> so the next one is. And again, you can update multiple rows. You got to be careful to include the where clause, otherwise it'll update all the things. Um, and as I just demonstrated, if you don't include the where clause, it just nukes the whole thing. Uh, so always include a where statement unless you're absolutely sure you want to update all the rows. Um, a very good way to get in the in a good habit of doing this is the second you type in the word update, type in the word where, and then fill in the rest. You know when you guys are programming, oh, you guys are using uh, an IDE, it's probably completing it for you. Um, you know in Java, when you start your if statement, you open up your curly bracket, probably uh, Eclipse is probably putting in your closing curly for you automatically. SQL does not do that. So MySQL Workbench does not put in your closing brackets automatically for you. There are other tools that will, but MySQL Workbench does not. This is very much colorful notepad. Um, you should get used to just developing a good habit of putting in the safeties before you even finish writing your command. That way, even if you were to go update example, example set name equal to Bob, if I try to run it like this, because I didn't specify, it'll give me an error message. And it'll say, hey, you have an error in your SQL. Literally, that's what it's saying. You have an error in your SQL syntax. Um, not a particularly useful error message, other than there's something wrong. That way, you can always make sure that you don't nuke the entire table. And now our first row is now Bob once more. Which leads me to, um, you can still do it in the bulk update if you want to target a group of things. Um, for example, if I'm not worried about a single row, but I want to say where name is equal to Daisy, and uh, they're going to become, uh, their name's suddenly going to become uh, this because they're special. And I'm going to hit run. Again, it's going to go. You will notice down here, five rows affected. So if I run this, 
you'll see now that Bob stayed Bob and all the daisies became something else. You can do a bulk update, but you can reduce what you're affecting by telling it to pick other things. We'll talk about the where clause next week in detail. So it was just, you know, I'm covering what the slide's talking about. Um, and this I'm definitely not going to talk about now. And then SQL delete. Um, this is something that's like, I mean, two weeks from now. They just threw it in the slide so we, you guys could have an example at this point. Um, SQL delete. Again, I'm going to go. No, not here. Delete from example where ID is equal to three. And if we come back over here and we go run, you can see here's three. Now I'm going to run this. One row affected. Three is gone. And you will also notice how fast that worked. There is no undo. Um, and once again, what's going to happen if I do this? Yes, deletes every all the things. And I run it. And now our table is empty. So this is where I'm going to talk about. You know, I was talking about truncate, and I was going to talk about truncate a bit later. I said I was this is where I'm going to talk about truncate. There's one other big difference between what I just did here, which is basically delete everything from the table and truncate. On a very large table that has a lot of rows, like a couple of million rows, delete will take a while. You can interrupt the command. Whatever was deleted will still be deleted, but you at least can stop it. Truncate is instantaneous. It doesn't delete the rows. It just goes to the table. Table, you are empty. There is nothing in your head. Oh, by the way, you're starting at one again. That's literally what it does. So if I do this, I did the delete. So I'm going to undo this until I have all my inserts again. <clears throat> so I'm going to run my inserts three, four, five, six times. And if I refresh this, you will notice that my ID is starting at seven because I did deletes. It doesn't reset the primary key. It just continues wherever it was at. So now if I were to truncate that table instead, truncate example, and I run it. So that took 0 0.031 seconds. Because not only is it emptying the table, it's altering the structure of the table by telling it, hey, by the way, you're starting at one again. That's why it took a little extra long. On a very small table such as this, and when I say a small table, I'm talking about a table with like 100,000 rows or less. Like anything under 100,000 rows in a database server, it doesn't even need to think about what it's about to do to the data. It's just gone. So if I were to insert a bunch of rows again, so I'm going to run this. Hang on. I'm working on my APMs. And you can see that I, I can, I'm able to click multiple times a second. Okay. So I just inserted 44 rows. If I do truncate, I go go. Heck, I went even faster than the first time. Why? Because I already ran the command and it knows exactly what it needs to do to the data at that point. Uh, if I come back to example, you'll see that example is nice and empty. Be very careful with truncate. It's a little dangerous. And no, you know what? Merge, you can read in the, you can see how complicated this command is. It's not going to be on any test. Uh, I've been working with database for 26, hang on. Yeah, yeah, uh, 26 years. I've never used the merge command. So that shows you how important this command is. It's cool. Feel free to read it. And see if you can understand it. Even better, take it, slap it in chat GPT and ask it to, to explain it to you. It'll do a much better job than me because 
It's really hard to explain something I've never used. Okay, so right now you have half of assignment two. I covered the knowledge for half of assignment two today. Shocking. So just so you guys know, it's not like last semester, the first half, the first semester, first half of the semester where you really couldn't even start working on the first assignment until like four weeks in. When I release assignment two to you guys, you're going to have like over half of what you need already. The lab, lab six is really important to do because it literally shows you how to do the first half of assignment two. It's just super simplified, but it's there. Um, okay. So next week, we are going to be talking about the select statement. Um, in actual fact, I'm going to show you guys the world's, you guys have already seen it, the world's simplest select statement. So when you're working on lab six, and there's some spots where it says, can you insert some rows? And you need to make sure they're in there. You're going to literally type it in like this. So this is select star from example. And this is saying, select all columns from a table called example. That's literally what it's doing. Select everything from example. No where clause, nothing. So it's literally saying, just give me everything, all the things. Next, you're going to learn about how to not have all the things and why you don't want to have all the things. Uh, on a small database, all the things doesn't make a difference. On a big database, all the things makes a big difference. Uh, it can be very, very painful performance-wise. Okay. Um, yeah. So Lab 6 should be visible to you guys. I will go... Uh, apparently, I closed my browser. I am going to go make sure that Lab 6 is visible to you guys. Hey, okay. well, that's I. What I'll, I'll talk, talk to you guys about what Lab Six is because I have time. You'll notice that the lectures in the second half are actually a little shorter than the first half because it's literally practical application skills, not you know trying to explain to you guys what a null is. Um, hang on, um, uh, hang on, I'm in the wrong spot. Labs. Oh God, I hate Brightspace. Lab six. Okay. In lab six, you will submit a text file. Don't submit a .sql. In MySQL Workbench, just so you know, you can come in here and go file, save script as, and you give it a name. Or you can do the clever thing and control A, control C, and paste. The reason we ask for it to be in a text file is that in Brightspace, we can actually view the file without having to download it if it's a .txt. Apparently, Brightspace is too stupid to understand that .sql is a text file. It's just a text file with a different extension. Okay, so you're going to provide it like this. You will notice at the top right here, there's these dashes. You guys have learned about comments, right, in Java? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, this is the Java equivalent to this. Okay. And it they finally brought in um, the block comments. We have block comments also. Um, not all database engines support block comments. So that's why I just I usually recommend just use the double dash comment because it'll work everywhere. And so you'd put in your student number, and then you're gonna go lab six. And then you're going to type in create, blah, 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 blah. That's what you're going to submit, okay? What's involved in here is there are, there you have a diagram. By this point in the term, you should understand how to read this diagram. You will attempt to recreate these tables. What's kind of cool is you'll notice there's a few different kinds of relationships in here. You know, there is non-identifying relationships, which means that the foreign key is nullable. There's identifying relationships, which means the foreign keys are part of the primary key. Um, there's different data types. I will warn everybody now, it is physically impossible to type in the commands 
in MySQL and get it and we'll do something called a reverse engineer to make it look exactly like this. My, it's impossible to do it. I spent four hours two semesters ago with the two students trying to get it to come back exactly the same. You cannot do it. And here's why. Once you've created the tables, MySQL doesn't know if things are identifying or not identifying. It just knows it's a relationship. So the lines will never come back the way they were in the diagram. So don't hurt yourselves trying to forget it to look exactly the same because it never will. Um, if you are want to make sure that you are close, what you can do is um, let me just go grab a different uh, table here. So I'm I'm in a, I just connected a different database called Inventory. Under Database, you can go Reverse Engineer, and um, you go Next. And if I'd use the connection, that would work. oh boy, what's my password? No password. Bad Dan. That's good. I can just use the existing connection. <laughs> uh, next, I want to back uh, my reverse engineer inventory. Next, next, execute. And it will take your database structure and um, create it for you. This particular database structure doesn't have foreign keys. That's why there's no foreign keys put in. But you can use the, a reverse engineer tool, which is literally a wizard. It's just next, 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 next. And you can type in your create table commands, reverse engineer it, see how close to the diagram it is. It then will be 100%. We can get pretty close. That way you can make sure that you have your um, foreign keys that are nullable, not nullable. You can make sure that your data types are set correctly. Um, you can make sure that things that are, see this is not null, but these are nullable. And you can see how that different colors, depending on whether something is required or not, that will reverse engineer. It's just the lines won't necessarily look the same. And what's the most important thing? That it runs. That it runs. And it runs clean. What we are going to do as profs is we're going to go control A, control C, go to MySQL, control V, and hit run. Does it run clean? I refreshed on left. Are there um, five tables? I will pick tables at random and pick one or two and go, good enough. Just like in Java, you would not submit an assignment that does not compile. You do not submit an SQL file to us that will not run clean. I see an error. Points come off the top. And you can see I put in a uh, grading <laughs> a grading guide. Lab 6 is out of 23 points. It's not out of 5. It's not out of 6. It's out of 23. I'm training you guys for the assignment. You get five points of their table creation scripts. You get all five points if it creates all five tables. If there are defects, and for those of you that don't know what defects means, those means errors. I'm also teaching you guys some uh, computer programming uh, terminology. Often uh, software defects are known as bugs or errors. Five points for inserting customers correctly. Three points for inserting product type correctly. Product type can be whatever the heck you want. Just make it up. Six points for inserting records in the products table because you have to insert values into the foreign key. That means you've got to figure out how you insert values into the foreign key. This is where, you know, your lab profs can help you get over that hump if you need to. Uh, two points for the updates. Two points for delete. And you're going to put everything in one file, and I'm going to take the whole thing, or a lamb, or wander, and we just get hit run. And then we watch. You know how we had all these nice little messages at the bottom? We watch those messages go by. Two rows affected, one row affected, five rows inserted. You know, we watch for that. Actually, it'd only be one insert at a time, but we'd see five inserts, for example. Um, that's lab six. Literally what I did today all together in one 
piece of work. Lab six tends to be either really, really hard for some people or really, really easy um, because of the syntax. Either you got the syntax or you don't. Um, the good news is you have my recordings, including my mistakes. So you have an idea of what to do when you see certain kinds of error messages. Yeah, that's it. That's all folks. Go enjoy the uh, soul melting heat outside. For those of you that come from a warm place, this is amazing. For those of you that, for those of us that come from places freaking cold half the year, this really sucks. I come from a place where there's snow in May. So this is terrible. Hang on. I just want to hit the stop record button.